Hey, welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Francisco, aka Paco Siller, and I'm here with my good friend, Ben Ward. Ben, how you doing? I'm great. Thanks, Paco. How are you? Pretty great. Um, if you all don't know, Ben has actually been live with us uh, plenty of times before as a host, and I think as a guest maybe once or twice. Um, yep. He works for Adobe as well. Well, what's your title, Ben, so we all know and what you do real quick for Adobe? Yeah, I'm the senior product manager on Lightroom. Senior product manager for Lightroom. So if you it have sounds really light... impressive, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it does. Yeah, it's a, it's a great sounding <laughs> title. So yeah, if you have any questions about Lightroom, this is the guy to ask. So as you know, we are live. I am looking at the chat. So head on over to YouTube or Behance. I got both chats open. This is a live stream. It's a two-way street. So if you have any questions or you have any comments or you just want to chat with us, hang out, feel free to pop in the chat and uh, join the conversation with us. Um, Paco, cool. I have so, a question. I can't yeah. see the chat. You'll relay questions to me, right? I will relay questions for you, my friend. That is my Perfect. job as a host. So do not worry about the chat. That's something Fantastic. that I'm looking at. You just worry about the projects that you have in hand. And uh, I will interrupt you from time to time to get that chat community engagement in. Uh, real quick, looking at the chat. I see Jack. I see Medallia. I see Gus. What's up, Gus? Good to see you, my friend. I see Robert, Oliver. Everybody's joining in. Thanks again for joining us. Again, safe space. We have... Lightroom senior product manager. Did I get that right? You did. That's I it. I did. So if you have any questions about Lightroom, this is the time to ask them. Uh, all right, cool. I won't take up any more of the time. Uh, ben, hello. What are we doing today? What's the plan? The plan is super simple. We are going to take a look at all of the newest features that are available in Lightroom. Uh, we had a new release at Adobe Max, which was a few weeks ago now. Um, we released a ton of great stuff. I'm going to share all of that with you. Uh, if we have any extra time after that, I've got a few bonus things uh, from uh, earlier releases that I can share as well. And I will be talking uh, about Lightroom, not Lightroom Classic. As many of you may know, we do have these two different products. Um, I'm the product manager for Lightroom, and I'll be talking about Lightroom and demoing Lightroom. However, uh, many of the things that I'll be demoing today are also applicable to Lightroom Classic. So there's something for everyone here. Excellent. I love it. And we got some bonus stuff in case we have some time. So cool. Uh, speaking of time, let's just hop right into it. I'm going to go ahead and go to your laptop screen real quick, my friend. Sounds good. Cool. We're on it. Okay, here I go. So I'm going to start off uh, this demo on my laptop, which is sitting right here on my desk. So you might see like the top of my head a little bit while I demo this very first feature for you. Uh, after this first feature, I'm going to switch over to my desktop computer and do the rest of it on my desktop computer. But there's a specific reason I want to demo this first feature on my laptop, uh, which will become clear uh, as I get into it. Um, so what I would like to show you is the new HDR feature in Lightroom. Now, you might be saying to yourself, hasn't Lightroom had HDR uh, for like 100 years? Um, Yes, what we've had is the ability to merge multiple exposures together into a high dynamic range file. So I'm expecting probably most of you know what HDR is, but just really quick, that stands for high dynamic range. And in the context of photography, it just means a scene or a photo that has very bright areas and very dark areas all in the same picture. Uh, and of course, our eyes can see a much greater range of brightness values than the camera can capture. So when we want to really faithfully capture a scene, we'll often take multiple exposures so that we can get the detail in the darks and get the detail in the lights, and then we'll squish them together into one photo that in contains the high dynamic range of all of the multiple exposures. Recording in progress. Whoops, well, all right. just talked in our ear. There we go. That's, that's We're okay. Recording stuff. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Got it, Karen, I have to dismiss that on my desktop as well. There we go, okay. Um, so what that looked like for anybody who isn't familiar with it is, you know, here I have a pretty high dynamic range scene, right? This is a, a sort of middle exposure here. Um, and, you know, you can't see a lot in the darks and the lights are kind of blown out. Uh, here's a darker exposure. Now I can really see the details in the light areas of the scene. But of course, the darker areas of the scene have gone to completely black. Uh, and then here I have a brighter exposure. And now I can see all those details in the in the dark areas and the light areas are just blown out. Um, so what I have been able to do in Lightroom uh, previously is select those exposures and go to photo, photo merge, HDR merge, and it will combine those three exposures into a single exposure. 
um, that contains the full dynamic range. And I'm not going to let it do this. Well, there it goes. It did it. But I'm going to cancel out quick. of this dialogue. Um, sorry, Paco? So that was pretty quick. Yeah. It, uh, oh, yeah. It merged them. I love me some HDR photographer. I actually shoot it a ton. So I love that little oh, well, shortcut and feature. You will be interested to learn about this then. So uh, I'm going to cancel out of here because I already uh, generated this file. Here it is. Now, what you've had to do previously, once you've created your HDR file via merge to HDR, is you've had to tone map that file down to fit in standard dynamic range space. And that just means you've had to, you can see what I've done over here on the right, actually. Paco, if I turn on my little cursor highlighter thing, is that Yeah, we can or? see it. That's actually very okay. useful. Yeah, it's kind okay. of blowing okay, up uh, right, right where you're hovering. So sweet. Great. Let's use it. Okay. Um, so you can see like here, you know, I, I took the highlights way down, I brought the shadows up and so on. And you've had to essentially take that high dynamic range, all those values that are in that HDR photo now, and, and squoosh them down to fit into SDR space. Why? Because that's all your monitor could display. Your monitor couldn't display that full range of values. Okay, that was up until today or six weeks ago or whenever we Ooh, released okay. this, right? But now screens that are capable of displaying HDR values are becoming more and more common. So my desktop computer, which I am not currently demoing on, does not have an HDR display. My laptop does, which is why I wanted to show you this feature uh, on my laptop. Um, if you have a, well, I got a little cable here, but if you have a, an iPhone from the last several years or any higher end Android phone from the last several years, that device has an HDR screen as well. Um, so they're becoming more and more common. And what that means is we can actually start to display these HDR photos in HDR without needing to tone map them down to SDR space. And they become so much more vibrant and present and dimensional and so much more feeling like you were there. It's really, really cool. And guess what? You're not gonna get to see it today. Why not? <laughs> Because this is not yeah. an HDR stream, right? That's right? Even if even if you're on an HDR display right now, which you may not be, but even if you are, you're not going to be able to see HDR because this stream that's coming into you, it's not HDR. But yes. I am going to show you. Sorry, Paco, go ahead. And I'll just say, yes, it's uh, it, we are streaming to YouTube and it heavily compresses. So what Ben is seeing is obviously not what we're showing. Uh, but while I have the mic real quick, though, we do have some questions coming in already, Ben. So. I'm going to take a, t take a quick second to answer these real quick. Yeah, for sure. Are they HDR related questions? Uh, you no, know, no. Can so I can say them after the H HDR section? Yes. Yeah, let me finish that. the HDR section and then we'll take the, uh, the unrelated questions after I finish, finish up let's this do section. It. Does that sound okay? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, there'll be a little bit of like, imagine if you will involved uh, in this in this demo, right? Because you can't see the actual HDR, but I'm demoing from my computer that actually has an HDR screen just for this feature uh, because the Lightroom user interface looks different if you're actually on uh, an HDR screen. And I want you to see uh, what that UI looks like. So you won't be able to appreciate the image itself, but you'll be able to see what the experience is like in Lightroom. So. If I want to edit a photo in HDR, I need to start with a photo that has some kind of HDR content. That does not have to be a file that you've created for multiple exposures using Merge to HDR. That's what I've done here. But even a single RAW file has a lot of overhead in it that uh, you know an SDR monitor can't display. So you can even use HDR editing with, with a single, single file. Um, even an HEIC from your iPhone, something like that, has plenty of headroom in it. Um, so you can benefit from editing in HDR. Uh, so I will turn on, I'm in edit here, and I, I should add, everything I'm showing you here is also available in Lightroom Classic. Uh, when I say everything, I mean all of this HDR feature that I'm showing you is available in Lightroom Classic. It's also available in Adobe Camera Raw, um, and it works the same way across all of them. So um, I'm going to go ahead and click on the HDR button to turn on HDR editing for this photo. At best, if you saw any change there, what you probably now see are some blown out highlights. But if you were here with me looking at this screen, you'd be like, oh my gosh, that looks so much better. Yeah, trust me on that one. Um, <laughs> and now that I've done that, you'll notice a few changes. And actually the, the first thing I wanna do here is I wanna, I wanna show the histogram. Let me turn HDR back off and you can see the histogram change as I turn HDR on and off. So here's the standard dynamic range histogram. I turn HDR on, now I've got 
special histogram with extra info for editing while I'm doing HDR editing. Um, so you see this center line here. Everything to the left of that, that's the SDR range of the histogram. And everything to the right of that line, this is the HDR range of the histogram. So you can see that this image, as, as edited now, has uh, quite a few values that are trailing into the HDR range. In other words, this line right here is UI white. If I went to, you know, the, uh, you know, the finder and this background is white, this, that's the value of this white right here is where that line is. And everything over here are parts of my image that are brighter than UI white. So you'll also see at the bottom here, there's this little line here and part of it's like highlighted light and then part of it's a dark gray. What does that mean? The parts that are highlighted light are the parts of the HDR range that my monitor that I'm on right now is currently capable of displaying. So that's why I wanted to do this demo for you on an actual HDR monitor, even though you don't get to see the image in HDR. Because if I were on my desktop monitor right now, this would all be grayed out down here and you wouldn't see, it wouldn't be indicating that I could display any of the HDR range because it can't. Um, this is affected by a number of factors. Uh, in particular, it's affected by how bright your screen is. So if I, I'm going to turn the brightness on my screen up and down in a second, and you'll see how it affects the range of HDR values that can be displayed. Why is that? Well, as I turn down the brightness on my screen, I'm essentially lowering the value of UI white, and that enables my monitor to display more values that are above UI white. So you won't, of course, see the image get any dimmer here as I do it, because it's just the hardware control for changing the brightness on my monitor. But you will see the on-screen overlay. See that come up down right down here? So you can see like... Oh, check that out. Yeah. yeah. So okay. as, I, I as I lower the brightness, I lower the brightness to there. Now I've got way more over-range values. So each one of these lines, these dotted lines, doo -doo -doo, that's a stop. So this is one stop above UI white. This is two stops above, three stops above, and so on. So if I turn my monitor brightness down to about here, I get a full four stops. My, my screen currently can display a full four stops above UI white. As I brighten my screen up, you'll see that what it can display above UI white goes down because I am raising the value of UI white as I brighten my screen up. Um, so to take advantage of being able to see and edit in HDR, um, there's not a hard and fast rule, but in general, any screen that can display a thousand nits of brightness or more is a good screen uh, for working in HDR. Let me show you a couple other things here. Um, down here in the curves, all of the edit controls, with the exception of curves, which I'll show you in one sec, all of the edit controls work the same in HDR or SDR. Um, the, the same settings for you know exposure, for example, or contrast might not look good with the HDR switch on or off, but they work the same way. Um, curve is a little bit different. Uh, so this lower left quadrant, this is the SDR section of the curve. And then all of this is all this extra room that you get now that you're editing uh, in HDR. OK, I'm going to show you uh, how to share these with people. And then I'm going to come back and show you one extra little feature in here that's pretty cool. Um, so if you just want to export this to send it somewhere else, of course, you go up here to a little share icon. You know, uh, Paco, I learned recently that uh, Apple calls this icon the Shero. The Shero. That is new. The Shero. <laughs> yeah, it's a little arrow and you use it for sharing. It's oh, the Shero. Oh, I see what they're doing there. I'm picking yeah, up what they're putting right. down. The Shero. Yeah, I feel a little bit dirty every time I say that. But uh, <laughs> click on the Shero. Uh, <laughs> And I'm going to just go to export custom settings. And then I got a bunch of choices in here for how I want to export. And I can export as we've got a couple of new formats in here. So newly added export formats. There's JPEG XL. And when I go to JPEG XL, I have HDR output as an option. Now you'll notice HDR is not visible in this preview that the preview in the export dialog is not displaying HDR, but that's fine. The, the photo will still export as HDR if you turn uh, if you choose to turn this on. Um, also newly added format is AVIF, which you can also opt in to including HDR uh, in the output if you wish. And then here's the thing that's, it's not secret. I want you to know about it, but it's not obvious when you look at the app. 
If you export as JPEG, that will also include the HDR info. There is no opt-in checkbox here. It's just, if it's there, if you've edited this photo in HDR and you export as JPEG, it'll be HDR. And right now, today, I would suggest that if you wanna share these out, these HDR photos that you've edited in Lightroom, you wanna share them out somewhere else, JPEG is probably actually the best format to use. And here is why. When you export it as a JPEG, and this is not currently true of the JPEG XL or the AVIF, but when you export it as a JPEG, it includes all the HDR info and it includes what's called a gain map, which translates between the SDR rendition of the photo and the HDR rendition of the photo. What does that mean? It means that you can control what your photo looks like to someone who is viewing it on an HDR screen and what it looks like to someone who's viewing it on an SDR screen. Now, this is not true, uh, this is not currently true of the JPEG XL or the AVIF, which don't have the gain map. Those just export as HDR. And if someone's viewing them on a screen that's not HDR, or they're viewing them in software that does not support HDR, they'll be tone mapped to SDR and they might look fine or they might not, but you don't know exactly what they're going to end up looking like because you're not in control of that. It's just whatever software they're right. being displayed on does that tone mapping. But if you're exporting as a JPEG, you are in control of it. Let me show you how it works. I'm going to cancel out of the export dialog. And you'll see right here while I'm editing, while I have HDR turned on and I'm editing in HDR, I have this SDR settings uh, controls here. I can expand that and I can turn on this checkbox for preview for SDR display. And that will show me right now on my screen what the photo is going to look like to someone who views this on an SDR screen, someone who doesn't have HDR capabilities. And then I can go ahead and control what that SDR rendition looks like. And so I have complete, as the photographer, I have complete control over both the SDR and HDR appearance of the photo when I export it as a JPEG. So that's super, super cool. Um, just a couple of other real quick things um, before, oh, and let me turn off why is the HDR portion of my histogram have a little eyeball with a line through it and isn't showing anything? Because so SDR settings. I am on. previewing for SDR yeah. display and I need to turn off that preview. Um, so, uh, and I can I can have the settings there, right? Like, so I say, oh, I you know this needs a lot more contrast in the SDR right. version. Great, and then I turn off the preview, keeps my settings for the SDR rendition. Uh, but now I'm seeing it in HDR again. But it'll export um, as SDR when you do that, right? Well, I guess what that's no, got, it's, that's so how it's going to look for someone who has an SDR monitor. Exactly, got exactly. It. That's how it'll look for someone who has an SDR display. Um, so I can uh, go over the clipping indicators and the behavior of the clipping indicators changes a little bit uh, when you're in HDR editing versus SDR. Um, when I'm editing in HDR, the yellow areas, a lot of my screen is yellow, so I don't know how well you're even seeing that, but the yellow areas are areas that are brighter than UI white, which my screen can currently display. And the areas that are red are areas that are brighter than UI white that my screen can't currently display. And you see that represented uh, up here under the histogram as well. So right now my screen, uh, based on the brightness setting I have my screen at, it can currently display two stops above UI white, and I'm not seeing the rest of that. Um, I'll turn off that clip in and I'll show you visualize HDR as well. If you want to see um, how many stops above UI white different areas in the image are, you can turn that on. It color codes them. You see the corresponding colors under the histogram, one stop above UI white, two stops, and so on. So you can see uh, what areas those map to on your image. And one last HDR control, you can limit how many stops above UI white uh, your image contains. Why would you want to do that? Well, um, if you know, for example, that you're going to be displaying to a particular screen that only allows, you know, three stops above UI white, you might want to limit right here to three stops above. Uh, and so that you edit within that space so that you're optimizing it for a screen, you know, you're going to be displaying on, I believe, and I don't want anybody to go around quoting me on this. Um, but I believe, for example, I think the iPhone can display three stops above UI. Like when I say the iPhone, I mean like the the newer the newer ones um, can display three stops above. So I might choose to limit um, the the over range values in this photo to three stops above to optimize for display um, on iPhones. Okay, uh, let me put that back to four stops. Um, 
let me, yeah, let me pause it there. I will show you um, one more thing about HDR, but only after I switch over to my desktop. So let's pause it here. Paco, I know there were some questions coming in. Yeah, yeah, there was a uh, one question from Ray. They're asking, is there a way to flatten and save a selection made in Lightroom and then export this selection to Photoshop? I believe there is, right? Um, so I want to give a good answer here. I might need to get a little bit of clarification on the question just so that I understand exactly what's being asked. I'm not completely sure um, what's meant in this context by flattening a selection. So if you want to expand on that a little bit and uh, help me out there, um, I'll do my best to answer that. Um, in okay. the meantime, um, there is an edit in Photoshop feature available in Lightroom. So nice. I can, if if I want to move over to Light uh, to Photoshop to do something else, um, I can do edit in Photoshop. It'll open my image up in Photoshop. I can do whatever I want to do in Photoshop. When I save it and close it in Photoshop, it automatically comes back into Lightroom with whatever edits I did uh, in Photoshop. Um, personally, I've been using that a lot recently for Gen Phil. When I have yeah. some big thing in a photo that it's just too big or gnarly to get rid of in Lightroom, edit in Photoshop, use Photoshop, Gen Phil to take it out, and back to Lightroom. Yeah, that, yeah, that's what I had in mind. Uh, Ray, if you're still with us, let us know if that answered your question. If not, then expand a little bit on what you mo what you mean by quote unquote flatten. Um, and then we had one more question and we can move on. Robert is asking, does Lightroom noise reduction work with a TIFF file? So I think that probably uh, the question is about the denoise button there, um, which is the AI denoise. So they're all, there are all of these manual noise reduction controls here, which I can expand and fiddle around with if I wish. But of course, the good stuff is the newer um, AI denoise, which does a really amazing job of removing noise while preserving and e even increasing detail. Um, and the answer is no. So currently, the AI denoise in Lightroom only works on uh, raw files, on, on Bayer raw files, um, or no, and Xtrans, I think. Ooh, I should know. But raw files, it doesn't work on TIFF. Um, it doesn't work on this photo right now, which is a merged DNG. Um, so let's see. It would work on this one, which is actually a nice denoise demo file that I have. Um, so you can see all the noise on there, and you can see now that button is active, and I can go into denoise right. that. So. Yeah, I've, I can vouch for that feature. It's pretty pretty awesome. Yeah, and I'll really I'll, I'll actually demo that came out a little bit uh, a little bit longer ago, like earlier this year, not not a few weeks ago at max. Um, so it's not at the top of my list, but demoing denoise is on my on my extra bonus material list, so we can totally get to this. Awesome. Um, cool. All right, let's move on. Okay, um, Paco, I'm going to switch over to my desktop computer now. Okay, let me go ahead and switch with you. All right, we are now on your desktop. Okay, this should look familiar. So I don't know how many of you out there use uh, Lightroom, um, but of course, uh, one of the great things about Lightroom is that it syncs everything back and forth. So I was working on my laptop uh, just now. Everything I did there, of course, synced over to my desktop because I'm signed in with the same account here. Um, all of my work syncs back and forth. It's really, really cool. And speaking of that, I'm going to switch over to my phone here. Now you can see Lightroom on my phone uh, as well. And I just want to show you real quick that HDR uh, editing is available on the phone as well. So. I'm in edit down here at the bottom and I'll go into the light panel and it's a little bit hidden down here at the bottom. It's on, of course, because I just turned it on on my desktop a moment ago and those edit settings synced over here. Um, but I would just turn it on right there if I wanted to turn it on. I've got the same visualize HDR controls. I've got the same preview for SDR uh, and SDR settings. I'm not going to re-demo everything for you, but just so you know, it's all here as well. Um, and uh, I can tap on the HDR icon up here and get my histogram. And the iPhone, now this is a little bit misleading, but you see how the HDR section of the histogram is just completely like redded out, like right now, uh, blocked out with red. I don't mean redded, blocked out in red. <laughs> um, and why is that? Because this is a new iPhone, not the newest, but the second newest. Um, and it's got an HDR screen. The only reason that this is not 
the, the only reason this is telling me right now that it can't display any HDR is that as soon as I connect it for sharing, it switches to SDR and it won't do HDR. So Good to know. <laughs> it, yeah, it treats it as a as an SDR screen as soon as it's sharing. So, um, so all of those HDR features are available in Lightroom on the phone as well. That is both uh, iOS and Android, um, and then also available uh, in Lightroom on the web. And so here's what's cool about that: I um, you cannot currently do all of that HDR editing uh, in Lightroom on the web. I don't know if um, if you're familiar with Lightroom on the web, but we have like most of the editing that you can do on the computer and the phone, you can also do in your web browser, which is kind of crazy. Um, so I've got the HDR here. And uh, but here's where this is really um, here's where this is really useful is when you're sharing. So the number of destinations that you can share to and have people actually be able to see it in HDR is very limited. And that's not just because a lot of people are on screens that aren't HDR, like lots of people, almost everybody with a telephone in their hand is on a screen that can display HDR, but lots of software won't display HDR. You share this photo out to social media, it doesn't display HDR. So even if you're on an HDR screen and this photo was edited in HDR, you're not gonna see it, but Lightroom Web will display HDR. So uh, you can share to Lightroom Web and I won't go into a whole sharing demo, um, but, you know, for any album that I've created in Lightroom, I can turn on sharing for that album. I can get a shareable link that allows anybody to go and see this album in their web browser. And if I've edited uh, a photo in HDR, they will see it uh, in HDR when they're viewing the, the album uh, at the link I sent them on, on uh, Lightroom on the web um, with a couple of big caveats. And the first caveat is... Uh, they need to be on an HDR screen. And the second caveat is they need to be using a browser that supports HDR. And currently that basically means Chrome, the, like the latest version of Chrome. Got yeah. It. So if you viewed, uh, if you viewed a Lightroom web album with HDR photos in it on an HDR screen in the latest version of Chrome, <laughs> you would actually see the photos You'll in HDR. It. Yeah. See all that HDR glory. Love yep. It. Now, having said that, um, like support for HDR is growing rapidly, right? And I would expect six months, a year from now, it's going to be a completely different scene, right? So there's going to be much broader support. Um, and I think that's going to come fairly soon. So we're definitely like uh, at the tip of the spear here in Lightroom right now. Um, but that support is that broad, like third party support is, I think, coming. Um, I sent you some links, Paco, and I think that uh, the I think the moderators have those links and can put them in the chat. Um, I've got three different links about HDR that I want to share with you in case any of you are interested in learning more about this. The first is a link um, to a blog post written by Eric Chan. Eric Chan is the main engineer on the Adobe Camera Raw team who really um, put this HDR feature together. Um, and he wrote a whole blog post kind of detailing its benefits and how to use it and all of that. And the blog post contains um, images in both SDR and HDR. So you can compare what the same image looks like in SDR versus HDR. Um, so this is, again, if you're on an HDR capable screen and you view it in Chrome, you'll really be able to see uh, what that really looks like. Um, there's also a, a huge amount of resources from Greg Benz. He's put together um, just tons of HDR resources on his website. Um, really great resources there, including, you know, information about what software supports it, information about recommended monitors and all kinds of that stuff. Um, and then Stephen Shanklin at CNET um, wrote a review of HDR in Lightroom after it came out um, and gives a really great perspective on that as well. So just wanted to share those out for anybody who is interested in that. I'm ready to move on past HDR now to other stuff. Um, I'll pause in case there's any questions before I do that, Paco. Cool. Um, no questions. The mods are now putting all the cl uh, links in the chat. So feel free to check them out. Jack Watson, thank you for doing that. Um, she went ahead and put all the links clickable. And yeah, just I just want to comment on all that HDR goodness. This is all really good stuff to know. Um, it's an explosion of knowledge. You know, I, I've been editing HDR with, I think, SDR uh, for a while. And, you know, I've always kind of been like, ah, I look good enough on social media. But it looks like now you have 
you can fine tune all these details in a more professional and advanced setting so that you're really optimizing for the right screens. Because that's right, I mean, the, the game is changing essentially on how pictures are being viewed and the amount of dynamic range that can be captured. So it's, it's good to know and now see that all this stuff is very fine tuned specifically to the type of screen that the uh, end product is being viewed on. So explosion of knowledge. I love it. I learned a lot. Thank you for uh, showing us all of that. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, 100%. I mean, it's like, when you see this, it's it you can't go back, right? Yeah. It's like it's like trying to go back and watch like standard def video now after you've been watching 4K. You're like, I can't watch that. You know, yeah. and once you've seen this stuff in HDR, it's like, I've been a fool all along for looking at this SDR stuff. You know, it's amazing. I mean, Stephen Shanklin in his article says something like, you know, a, a few days ago, I thought I knew what HDR was. I was wrong. And that's how I feel every time I, I turn really on know. that HDR button. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Thanks for uh, letting us know. And I think that's a great analogy. I mean, yeah, once you've kind of experienced high def, like even when 1080 was starting to become normal, you couldn't go back to SDR after that, right? like 480p yeah. VHS. Psh, yeah. No, thanks. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about the next new feature that's available in Lightroom. And again, just like HDR that I just finished demoing, this is also available in Lightroom Classic, excuse me, and also Adobe Camera Raw. Um, so I'm demoing in Lightroom, but everything I'm showing you on this next feature also fully applicable to Lightroom Classic. Um, and so this is our new, oh, I'm going to turn on my handy little uh, cursor thing here too. This is my new point color, my, it's not mine. <laughs> it's seriously not mine. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, this is the new point color feature in Lightroom. And this is really cool. So you'll find it in the color panel. It's this new, uh, new little tab you can expand. And this is, for anybody who's familiar with Color Mixer, this is like kind of like Color Mixer on steroids. So what Color Mixer does is it lets you target a particular color in the image and then adjust hue, saturation, and luminance for that color. And in, in, in I was about to say in simple terms, but I don't know if this is really simple. Anyway, uh, in some kind of terms, Color Mixer is like one dimension in, three dimensions out. In other words, if I want to adjust this color right here, say using color mixer, I'm adjusting, like I'm selecting the color that I am going to adjust based on its hue, saturation, and luminance just is what it is. Like I'm not, I can't, I can't differentiate between those. I can then adjust each of those separately, but it's all coming in one dimensionally. And then I can change each of these three aspects of it separately in color mixer. In point color, it's like three dimensions in, three dimensions out. So I can select on the basis of both hue, saturation, and luminance. And then I can adjust each of those three things as well. So let me take a look at what that actually means and what that lets you do. So I've got this picture here. Let's say I'm looking at this like kind of uh, yellowish grass and I wish that it was greener, right? I want all of this grass to be kind of the green of the green parts, right? Well, if I try to do that with color mixer and I'll just use the little target adjustment tool here and I'll click on hue so that I'm adjusting hue and I'll click and drag on that color with the color mixer. It works for sure, but look at all the other greens in my photo. Look at the man's shirt, for example. Yeah. Like I'm really affecting that as well. Color mixer doesn't let me get precise enough about the color that I'm affecting to really target just that yellowish grass. I'm affecting a whole bunch of other values around it as well. And that's not what I want, right? So let me reset the color mixer by the way pro tip hold down option on the mac alt on windows and the panel headers change to say reset and you click them and it'll reset the whole panel nice um, very cool pro tip yeah. i didn't even know that right. All, all right all right there you go there you go you learned something you can you can take off for the day um <laughs> no don't do that i need you uh okay so here i am in point color how would something like this work in point color well I'll go ahead and I'll click on this little eyedropper tool here. And this lets me select the color that I want to work with. So I'll click on the color I want to work with. OK, there it is right there. And now I'm going to do my hue shift. I want to make it greener. So I'm going to shift the hue more towards green. And I'll show you a few things here. So I'm going to just crank it all the way. First, you can see, OK, it's showing me what it started with and where I moved it to. So that's the first thing it's showing me up here. Second, I'm still affecting like a lot of the image, not as much as I was before, but still more than I want to be, right? So I need to narrow my selection even further. And before I do that, of course, I can also change saturation and I can also change luminance. Okay, 
Great. But hue is what I'm interested in right now because I'm trying to make the yellow grass green. So I can change the range of colors that are being affected. So I can, uh, do, do, do. I'll crank that up again so you can see it. If I turn the range up, it's affecting more and more colors. If I turn it down, it's affecting fewer. And if you look, look for example here in the man's skin tone right here with the range all the way up, see how green his skin tone is? It's because it's being affected by uh, that hue shift that I made. Look what happens when I bring the range down. It's affecting much less of his skin tone there, right? Okay, cool. That's neat, but I'm still having a little trouble. I wish I could visualize better what I'm doing here. Oh, look, a turn down triangle. Turn down triangles, so handy. They hide so much power. Let's click that. Okay, this is showing me where my selected color started and where I moved it to. That's pretty neat. You'll see that move around like so. And then over here, it'll show me the luminance as I move that, right? So showing me where it started and where I moved it to. But also, when I change the range, it's showing me the... Uh, bounds of the colors that are being affected by the change. So watch this. So I move it up. I'm affecting more colors. I move it down. I'm affecting fewer. You oh, see that up there? Yeah, I, yeah. I like that masking overlay. That's kind of giving you a visual rep representation of what it's doing. Very useful. Exactly. Okay. But what if that's still not enough? What if I want to get really fiddly with it? I can look, a turn down triangle, click the turn down triangle. And now I've got just this crazy nonsense here. So what is this? This allows me to really precisely specify exactly the hue, saturation, and luminance of the color that I want to target here. And I can uh, expand or narrow that range. So this here's the little circle is the center of like, let's say just we're just look at hue for right now, the hue that I'm targeting, that I'm starting with. So I can change that like that, right? To change which hue I'm targeting. But then... I can move these handles in to really narrow the range down. So I'm targeting only a very small amount of the hue, just the area between these handles here, except wait, what's this handle way out here? And what's this handle way out here? Well, what that is, is if you look, I can't, I, I need two cursors here. It's like needing more than two hands. I, if you look up here at the range that I'm targeting, while I click here, you can see that there's quite a bit of fade off, right? There's a big feather at the edge of the range. That's what these are controlling. They're controlling that feather. So if I move it in, whoop, I want to grab that other one too. No feather, right? Now, whoop, hang on, now you can't see it. There you go. Like I've taken the feather off completely. Um, so that's what those are. Oh, geez, can I move this? There we go. I got them too close together. Um, so I can really precisely target the color that I'm after uh, using hue, saturation, and luminance and these sliders to really kind of target in on the range. Um, and I can visualize that on image as well. Um, so if I click visualize range, it shows me, and I've really kind of messed it all up here as I've been demoing this, but um, it shows me exactly um, in color, that's the part that's that I've selected that's being targeted and the black and white parts are not being affected. So I probably want to shift this down more to about there. And now you can see I've really selected all of that yellow grass. Mm -hmm. And I might even need to make a few more adjustments here on saturation and luminance because you see I've still got a little bit selected in the trees and a little bit selected on his face. But, you know, in terms of the grass itself, I've really managed to target just that part that I was that I was going for. Um, and then I could finesse further from here with the saturation and luminance ranges to narrow that more. Um, I want to show you another cool application of this, um, but I'll pause for a drink of water and questions if there are any. Yes, uh, no questions at the moment. So again, if y'all have any questions about these new features that Ben is showing us, uh, feel free to pop them in and I'll try and get them in when we can. But uh, just a comment. Uh, I love the little, uh, what you said about the little exploding triangles when you expand them. They do hold so much power. And they all do. These, they, they, yep. Yeah, you really fine tune them. <laughs> you can see you really targeted those yellows. Can we see um, how it all looks now with uh, all the colors just to see if it matches the green? Yeah, so um, so if I... Yeah, check that out. So cool. Yeah, I'm pretty much... Look at how I'm changing that grass so dramatically, but his shirt's right. staying the same color Super now. Super targeted, yeah. Right? Yeah. Very cool. Um. So, very cool feature. Here's another thing that's cool about it. I'll use a different photo for my example here. Uh, it can be used in masking, right? So these are global edit control. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I forgot a key aspect here. You can have eight of these color swatches. 
Wow. So I'm just, just using one right now to target the grass. But if I wanted to do something different with this blue, boop, 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 blue, and now I'm uh, now I'm working on this one. And if I want to go back and work on this one, I can do that. So I can have up to eight of these up here, which is really cool. There, um, to know. Yeah, tons and tons of power there. Okay. Um, you can use this in masking as well. So look at this photo here. Very cool. Got my fashion model. I got my helicopter. It's just another another regular work day for me. Um, Did you shoot this, Ben? Totally not. This photo is from Katrina Iceman. So I was gonna um, say, man, you're was... you're doing some cool stuff that I had no idea. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I get around. I get around. No, I sit right here at my desk all day working <laughs> on making Lightroom for you guys. Um, oh, but Katrine gets out of the house and she took this amazing picture and was gracious enough uh, to let me use it for this demo because it uh, does a really great job of demoing um, one of the great um, use cases for the new point color feature and in particular using it with masking. Um, so what you can see here, and I'll zoom in a little bit, is you can see that this sort of yellowy green of the helicopter is really bouncing onto her, right? And her yeah. skin tone along the side of her face here um, is really a little bit greenish. And, you know, what do we super, super care about in all of our portrait photography and especially in whatever fashion magazine this is going into is skin tone, right? Um, and so I want to fix that. Okay, let's do it. So I'm going to go into masking. Of course, that's this button right here. And I want to select just her skin because I just want to adjust her skin. So look, here's detecting people. Okay, great. It found her. Um, I don't want to select all of her, right? If I roll over, you can see it It masks her and a little bit of the lettering on the helicopter, but it did a pretty good job. Um, but I don't want all of her. I just want her face, right? So I'm going to go ahead and click on her and mask in there, and I'm going to select just the parts of her that I want, which in this case is facial skin. And actually, I think I'm going to her hair too, because there's quite a bit of green on her hair. So I'll go ahead and do hair as well. I don't know if that's actually a good idea. We're just, we're learning together, right? Um, so I'll go ahead and click create. Okay, now I've got a, I've got that mask, and now I can uh, edit just this area of the photo. Of course, the red area is showing me the area that's masked, and is, that's the area that will be affected now by my edits. And hey, what have I got here in masking? I've got point color. So I'll go ahead and click my eyedropper, which is not working. There we go. And I'll click on her kind of yellowy, greeny yeah, you skin can there. Just see it just a little bit yeah and now i'll just take that hue down i'll do be a little bit extreme here right now but you can see you know i'm affecting just her skin right i'm not in her hair I'm not affecting the rest of the photo um and so i'll take that down and that's really too much and i will take saturation down a little bit and i'd probably take luminance up a little bit or something and you can all now you all know that i am not a portrait photographer um okay uh and then i'll do when i click and hold on the little eyeball on any of these panels uh while i hold the the mouse down it turns off whatever that panel is doing so i can see what this looks like without that adjustment i just made and there it is without i don't know how well this comes over video streaming there it is with, it. and you can, yeah, you can see I've really taken the green out of her skin there. I've got a much nicer skin tone, even though I'm not the world's greatest portrait editor. Um, but that certainly gives you the idea. So point color in Lightroom, also available in Lightroom Classic, also available in Adobe Camera Raw. Very powerful. Cool. All right. Shall I move on, Paco? Let's keep it going. Yeah, just a quick time okay. check. We got about, I'd say, 40, 45 minutes. So we got plenty of time to show all these cool okay. new features. Okay, great. I only have another 147 features I want to share. So maybe I'll talk faster. Um, but um, this one, okay, this is uh, now this now you can tell this is a photo I took. That's my wife and daughter. Um, okay, let me collapse point. What did you there. shoot this on, Ben? Was this my an telephone? Or do you have a camera? Okay. No, this was taken with my phone. So took this picture with my phone. And I want to show you a new feature called lens blur. It's down lens here at the blur. bottom. Got this little badge on it that says early access. What does that mean? It means eh, we're still working out the kinks. So what's really cool is you can click on this stuff and send us feedback, give feedback. If you try it out, it works for you, let us know. It doesn't work for you, let us know. And we use your feedback to refine the feature and then you know make it like released like officially for real, not like early access anymore. Um, but you can check it out now, even though it's maybe not quite done. Um, this is a really handy thing for us to be able to do 
in particular with features that use AI because they tend to require a lot of refinement and having a really broad swath of people try them out is super helpful um, for making them really, really good. So check it out, send us your feedback, let me know what you think. In the meantime, I will show you how it works. I'll open this up here. Um, what does it do? Let me close that, okay, <laughs> turn down triangles. Um, this is a little bit like, if you have an iPhone, you probably are familiar with portrait mode. Um, I, I don't use Android, but I'm sure that there is an equivalent feature on Android um, where it blurs out the background of your photo and keeps the subject crisp, right? Why do you want to do that? Well, you have a picture like this. And of course, my wife and daughter are the part of the photo that I care about. But I've got all of these like pretty well in focus, distracting elements in the background that are kind of detracting from the overall uh, photo, the part of the photo that I care about. Well, when you use like portrait mode on your phone, um, it blurs out those background areas and it just kind of focuses on the subject. What is it doing when it does that? Well, it's emulating a shallow depth of field that you get from a real camera with a big sensor and a real lens with a big aperture. And when you have a big sensor and a big aperture, you get a shallow depth of field. And so that's why, you know, like you see a portrait photographer with like a longer lens, they shoot wide open, they have a big real camera with a big sensor and they got a nice soft blurred out background with a beautiful crisp and focused subject. And you can't really do that on a telephone because the sensor is this big, which means basically right. everything is in focus all of the time. Um, and so the way that the phones get around that is with math, right? They say, well, you know, it's computational photography. They don't need to actually be able to achieve it for real with physics and optics and lenses. They can use math to do it. They can use software to do it. And so they, when you take the picture using like portrait mode on your phone or whatever, they are collecting depth information about the scene. And depending on what phone you have, they're doing it either by taking the picture with two cameras at the same time, which sort of mimics our two eyes, right? So that they get, they use that offset between the cameras to calculate depth in the scene, or they're using on some phones, they use LIDAR. So they're actually like shooting out a little laser and like scanning the scene and they're getting real depth info about the scene. And then using that to build a depth map. And they use that depth map to blur out parts of the photo selectively based on their depth. Whoo, very cool. Problem yeah, is, I gotta say that's that's pretty cool. You know, I, I've always wondered how they did it. I wonder if they had something to do with AI, but uh, yeah, I guess you know it makes sense. The iPhone has three cameras, so it's taking two of them. One's wider, one standard. So I guess it's using those to kind of use this computational math that you've been talking right. about. It's right. pretty cool to know the the inner workings on how they get around that. Yeah. And they are, to, to the best of my knowledge, I don't work for Apple, I have no inside knowledge, but as I understand it, they're not using AI, right? They're actually collecting depth information yeah. about the scene and then using that to do it. Well, the limitation of that is you need to do it when you capture the photo, right? Because they're actually capturing the depth information at the time of capture. And you can only do it at certain focal lengths on the on the phone, right? Because uh, I don't know why, because, but it only does it with the zoomed in one, probably because it needs the wider one to get the... Um, offset info for uh, the depth. Um, so I wouldn't have been able to take this picture like that, right? Because this is wide. I've taken the, I'm really close. I've taken it wide. I just couldn't use portrait mode and get this picture. But boy, I still wish that background was blurred out like I could have gotten if I'd had like an SLR with a full frame sensor and a wide open, you know, F1 aperture or F12 aperture or whatever. Okay, well, now you can do this in Lightroom on any photo. So it doesn't have to be something that you took this way at the time with your phone or whatever. You can do it on any photo. And Lightroom does use AI. And it looks at the photo and it doesn't need any real depth map information. It just looks at the photo and figures it out. Really, for real. So click on the apply checkbox. Okay. Estimating depth. OK, it's thinking. It needs to figure this out. It's looking at my photo. And... So curious to see. If it's going to pick both subjects yeah. or one subject, does it know? Well, it got both yeah, of them. So you can see the background has dropped out of focus. Very nice. I have a blur amount slider here where I can control how much out of focus the background is. I'm going to crank it all the way up because I just want it to be really easy for you all to see what I'm doing here. Um, so we'll make it as extreme as possible. There we go. That, at least on my screen, is not super realistic looking. I've blurred it a little bit too much uh, for how in focus uh both of my subjects are. Um, but again, this is just so you can see what I'm doing here. Um, so that's very cool. Uh, 
all these little blurred out highlights in the background, of course, that's called bokeh. And, and we love to be super uh, particular about what our bokeh looks like. Well, turn down triangle, click that. You can change the shape and style of the bokeh in the background. That's cool. How about that? I like this cat eye one that kind of uh, replicates sort of old vintage lenses. Uh -huh. So you had asked, Paco, is it going to focus on one or the other of the subjects? By default, it focuses on the subject, whatever the subject might be. It uses AI to identify the subject in the photo. It's realized that my family here is the subject. So it's put them in focus and it's blurred out what's behind them. But I can change that. I can click on this little, um, I don't know, crosshair icon. And I can click on the photo on the part that I want to be in focus. And it'll set the focus oh, there. That's pretty cool. That actually yeah, looks, I think, pretty legit. You know, that right? actually like looks like a, <laughs> you actually shot that with like a zoom lens. Yeah. yeah. So then here we go. Another turn down triangle. I can open that up. More power. I can see my more power. <laughs> I can see my full focal range down here. So um, the like yellowy, orangey are things that are closer to the camera. Fading to pinky, purpley, blacky are things that are farther away from the camera. If I turn on the visualize depth checkbox, you can see that represented on the image so you can see how that corresponds to this focal range um, control down here i'm going to turn that off for the moment so you can actually see what i'm doing now i don't have to just use this like you know focus on my subject button or focus where i click button i can drag my focal plane forward and backward through the image that is cool and this is a very cool feature i'm digging it i like it a lot I can change the depth of field as well. So the little circle there in the center, that's the focal plane. And then I'm, I have focus falling off out to either of these handles here. So if I want to make the um, depth of field bigger, I can drag those handles out. Now I've included my daughter in that depth of field. Or I can narrow it down, get a really shallow, uh, shallow depth of field. And if I have the visualized depth turned on while I drag this, the part that it highlights in white, that's the part that's in focus. So I can use this to help me really like, okay, there we go, right on my daughter's face. And you can even see how like, hang on. You can even see how like her hair up here is like just dropping out of focus, right? Because it's a little bit right. farther forward than than her face, you know? So it's really pretty, pretty sophisticated in, in generating that depth map. Um, so now you can see I've got her in focus there. Um, okay, what if it made a mistake? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it's AI. It's not perfect. It's not going to get it right every time. What if there is a part of the photo that should be blurry, but it's actually in focus or should be in focus, but it's actually blurry? I can refine the depth map. So again, I'll click my turn down triangle. I've got a bunch of controls here. These are just brush size controls for my focus brush or my blur brush. And then this is the amount. Uh, so if I want to make it extra in focus or extra blurry or whatever or less so, um, I can control that. But if I have a part that is um, in focus, but it should be blurry, I can get my blur brush and brush over it, vice versa with the focus brush. So really cool there. Um, I will pop very quickly over to my phone just to show you over here as well. Here we are. And there it is on my phone, blur. I can tap in there. Um, I've got the um, blur amount slider here. There's no checkbox. I just kind of crank up the amount slider on mobile and it, it'll do it. So you can see it's done it there. Um, and I can control uh, my the style of my bokeh as well uh, here on mobile. And I can control whether it's focused on the subject or I can click uh, and pick the, the point that I want to focus on. Um, that's the extent of the controls on mobile mobile doesn't have those additional um depth of field controls and it doesn't have the refined controls but it's got the basic feature uh there on mobile as well um and just a quick side note you probably noticed when i came in here on my phone uh none of those lens blur edits that we had done on the photo over on desktop are showing here on my phone why not i thought everything's supposed to sync um we don't want to be like hitting the server every single time you like drag a slider like you move slider one, bing, you move slider again, bing. So what we do is we sync the edits all at once as soon as you move to the next photo or switch back to the grid view. 
So if oh, I were cool. to switch back to grid view now, or when I go to the next photo, um, it will, uh, it'll sync those edits up and then I'll see them on my phone. Um, nice. I'm going to show one last super quick thing about lens blur. We do have this a question a... that does yeah, relate yeah. to lens blur that I want to get in real quick. Uh, James yeah, is asking, can all this be done in Lightroom Classic as well? 100%. Thank you for asking. I keep meaning to make a point of calling that out. Uh, and if I forget, yes, ask me. Um, yes, all of the lens blur that I just showed is in Lightroom Classic, and it's also in Adobe Camera Raw. Nice. Um, this is also a photo from Katrina Iceman. Uh, and this was taken with a real camera with a big lens and a big sensor. And you can see that the background actually is a little out of focus, um, but not as much out of focus as Katrine wanted it to be um, because she's kind of stopped down. Well, if she wanted a shallower depth of field and wanted the background more blurred, why didn't she open up? Why didn't she open up the aperture to get that? Because she wanted this starburst effect from the sun and you get that with a small aperture. You don't get that if you have a big aperture. So she had to stop down to get the starburst effect that she wanted. And what that gave her then was a background that was more in focus than she wanted. This is all just to say that there are going to be occasional use cases where you might want to use the AI blur feature, the lens blur feature in Lightroom on a photo that you took with an actual grown-up camera as well. Grown so pretty neat. <laughs> Best of both worlds okay. right there. Very yeah, cool. right. Um, all right, I'm going to move on from from uh, from lens blur, unless there are any questions about that. Uh, no questions. So once again, everybody, we got Ben for about the next 25, 30 minutes. So any questions relating to the uh, awesome features that Ben is showing us, feel free to ask, and I'll try and get them in. Uh, but for now, let's keep on checking along. Okay, cool. I have uh, I have another edit feature to show you. And this is, well, it's not Lightroom only exactly, but you will, you will see as I show it to you. Okay. Um, I want to talk about healing in Lightroom. Healing, of course, is generally for removing things from the photo that you don't want in the photo. Um, and if you have something small or something against a uniform background, it's very easy and it does a great job. Um, it's right up here. Heal. What if I have um, this thing here? I've got this little uh, rag. I think it's a mask, actually, and a box of matches. It's overlaying a pretty complex pattern. It obstructs the clean edge of the table. It's uh, also a little bit over the chair there. How well does the heel do in Lightroom on this? Let's find out. I will paint over it. Do -do -do. Let me make sure I get it all. Okie dokie. Real bad. Eh. Real, real, real not so great. Um, well, we want to make that better, of course. Um, oftentimes, if we have a feature that we're experimenting with, uh, we might introduce it in Lightroom on the web first because we can experiment and iterate uh, much more uh, easily and much faster in Lightroom on the web than we can in like an installed app on the computer uh, or right. on the phone. Um, so we have a little experiment running over in Lightroom on the web. Uh, let me go ahead and delete that and I'll get out of here and I'm going to switch over uh, from the Lightroom application to my web browser uh, and we will, where is it? There it is. We'll take a look at this photo and we'll go into healing here. And now you will notice, other than the thing down here that says early access, we already talked about what that means, leave feedback. Please do try it out and give us your feedback. Um, you will notice that the UI is exactly the same. There's no changes to the UI here, but the technology underlying this has been changed here in Lightroom on the web. And once we kind of get it refined and get the kinks worked out, um, we'll roll this new and improved healing technology over into the rest of the Lightroom applications as well. So let's take a moment to see how it works here. And can I do this here? I should have selected a larger brush size. That's okay. I'm committed. Ooh, I'm really getting some... Uh, little glitches in my browser. If this doesn't work out, Paco, I'm going to probably switch back to my laptop on a, a different browser where I know that it works well, but we'll try it here and see how it goes. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Just let me know. Really 
curious to see. It's thinking, it's man. It's doing some it hardcore math there. Yeah, it's thinking. Hey, hey, check that out. Check that out. Miles so, better. Miles better. Reasonably credible reproduction of the pattern. Continued the straight line of the table edge. It's got the yellow for the chair where the yellow for the chair is supposed to be. So much better uh, job there than it, than the current version that's available in mobile and desktop. Uh, the mobile app and the computer app does. So this is just web right now. Um, but if I do this edit on the web, say, OK, great, awesome. Um, and it syncs, of course, it'll sync back to Lightroom on my computer. It will show properly here. So it'll it'll take that a moment to update. We'll come back and check on it in a second once it's had a chance to sync. Um, but the edit will show correctly here. Um, I just can't do that edit here yet, but right. coming soon. Okay. Coming soon. Coming soon. Um, all right, I'm gonna move on. Oh, there it is. You see that there? Yeah, check that okay. out. Okay, so it synced, synced that edit over. So very nice. Okay. Um, great. Let me talk about the next feature. Um, this is pretty cool. I think, um, there's, there's, th this is a feature that is likely to appeal to a number of existing Lightroom customers. Um, this is a Lightroom specific feature, but Lightroom classic customers, this is something you might be interested in as well. Specifically, if you are a Lightroom classic customer who has ever been Lightroom curious, um, I know that there's a handful of Lightroom Classic customers out there who are like, oh, I'm actually intrigued by Lightroom. Some of what Lightroom does that Classic doesn't do would be really useful for me. But the fact that I need to have every single one of my photos in Lightroom synced to the cloud is kind of a deal breaker for me. If you find yourself in that category, listen up. Ben, you just, uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest here. You just listed exactly me. I'm exactly. a Lightroom Classic hey, guy. This is for you, Paco. I'm a Lightroom <laughs> Classic guy. I've been curious about Lightroom. I've actually been trying it more. Uh, I got a near camera and I can essentially do mobile editing because I can transfer because now that my camera has a Wi-Fi, I've been using mm -hmm. Lightroom more and more on my phone just for the mobile editing feature. But I am Lightroom curious, as you say, because I've always been a Classic guy. Listen up. So I'm you listening. will notice here in the upper left corner, there is now a cloud tab and a local tab. Hey. So. For anybody who doesn't know the basics of this already, up until a few weeks ago, uh, every single photo that you imported into Lightroom synced to the cloud. There are a ton of benefits for that, right? Everything's backed up. You can work across devices. Um, it makes sharing and collaboration super easy. There's some cool AI stuff we can run in the cloud that we can't really run very well locally. Um, lots of advantages to that. But of course, there are some disadvantages as well. Um, maybe you have, you know, you don't have great broadband internet and it's not really practical for you to sync everything to the cloud. Uh, maybe you have so many photos that it's cost prohibitive for you to sync everything to the cloud. Maybe you're a professional and you want the jobs you're working on now to be synced to the cloud so that you can easily collaborate and work across devices. But a job from five years ago, not so much. You don't really need that in the cloud anymore. Let's take a look at what Lightroom gives you now. Local. So I will switch over to the local tab. What do I have here? Basically, on the left, it gives me a file browser over here. I'm just going to go into my home directory here. I'm going to go to my desktop. I'm going to click on this folder, China Trip, and it shows me these photos that are in that folder on my desktop. So I want to make a kind of a cool distinction here uh, at the outset. Not only can I work on stuff now in Lightroom without syncing it to the cloud, I don't even need to import it. There was no import step here, right? I just went and looked in this folder and now I've got this stuff. I can do rating, I can do flagging, I can do my other metadata edits and I can do editing. Double click it, here I go. Here's all of my edit controls, all the editing that I can do when the stuff synced to the cloud, here it is. I can do it here as well. So I'll just do a few edits on this photo. I don't know, whatever I kind of want it to be like. Yeah, something like that, that's fine. I've done all of that. There it is. I didn't import it. I didn't sync to the cloud. I did my editing. Do I need to send this somewhere? I can export it out and do whatever I need to do with it. Uh, if I want it in the cloud, maybe for example, this was, you know, hundreds of photos that I just captured and I wanted to kind of look through it and maybe sync just the best ones to the cloud rather than everything. Um, I can do that. I can sync any given photo that I want up to the cloud. So I have one photo selected right now, copy one photo to cloud. Um, I could do a multi-select if I want. 
copy three photos to the cloud. Uh, if I want, I could copy a, uh, a whole folder to the cloud at once, copy to cloud. Um, I'm going to do it just with this one that I just edited. I'll go ahead and click on copy to cloud. It says, hey, this is what we're going to do. I'm like, yep, that's cool. And one photo added to cloud. Where is it? Well, let's go look. Recently added. I'm back in the cloud section now. Just now. OK, yep, there's that photo oh, there that I is. added just now. Now I can continue to work with it here uh, in the cloud section. And I can switch over. It's syncing right now. You can tell because it's got that little blue icon on it. But when it's done, uh, it'll show up over on my phone. I can work with it there, whatever I want to do with it. Um, if I edit the copy that's local again, let's say, you know, we'll just do something really noticeable and make it black and white. I can update those edits to the cloud if I wish. So if we go back to the cloud right now, cloud, um, it's not, it's not black and white, right? It's color because I didn't edit it in the cloud. I edit it in local. But what if I edit in local and I do want those edits up in the cloud? I can say update edits to cloud and it'll say, hey, this is what you're doing. I'm like, yes, I'm cool with that. Do it. Um, it doesn't have to resync the whole photo, right? It's just metadata. It's just syncing the edits up there, syncs those edits up to the cloud. Um, they should probably show in the cloud copy in a moment. There we go. And if I go into versions, versions uh, in Lightroom, for any Lightroom Classic customers out there, in Lightroom, we have this thing called versions. And it's kind of a combination of the edit history panel and the edit snapshot panel. So if I go into versions, here's named versions. These are like snapshots, basically, for anybody who's familiar with the feature in Classic. But if I go over to Auto, I can see um, versions that are created automatically. And it included the original look of the photo when I first uh, uploaded it. Um, is there. And now here's my new edit. So if I uploaded those new edits from local to the cloud, and then later I was like, oh, wait, I didn't mean to do that. I can always switch back to the to the other version as well. Um, so in addition to all of that, I can also do full file system based organization here. So I can, you know, I can, uh, well, actually, let me let me do it for real. Um, I can, well, I'm going to create a subfolder, let's just say. So I'll create a folder in China trip. Uh, my sub folder. There it is. Um, I can drag and drop photos between folders. There we go. I can rename folders if I need to. I can drag folders. Or, oop, hang on. I can drag folders around and put them somewhere else if I need to. So I can do all of this. Oops, I just messed up. I just messed up Zoom. Hang on. Stand by and hide floating media controls. There we go. Um, so I can do like file system based. Uh, uh, organization right on my local hard drives here if I want, um, or a connected NAS or whatever I might have. It'll all uh, show up over here. Um, so you now have the ability to be selective about what you sync in Lightroom. You can work with all this stuff locally and then just sync the stuff up that you want to. Um, awesome. I've got a, got two questions out of this yeah. segment. Um, yeah. One, um, has print been added to Lightroom yet? So in Lightroom, we do not have the ability that Lightroom Classic has to print to a local printer, right? Like that you have sitting on your desk connected over USB or whatever. Um, we do have the ability to um, connect directly to uh, print services uh, and send photos directly from within Lightroom to print services of your choice. Um, but we do not have the ability to print to a local printer, cool. like and a then, locally connected printer in your... Yeah, then someone else is asking, well, now I have to ask, why do I need Lightroom Classic anymore? I think it's more of a question comment when you display the fact that you can have selective sync now. That's an excellent question. Yes. We do want to make Lightroom as appealing to as many people as possible. So if it's working Definitely. for you now, that would be awesome. There's so many cool things about being able to use the cloud aspect of it. Um, so now that you're not 100% committed to the cloud aspect of it, you can really take advantage of those benefits without needing to be all in. Yeah, that, that was a big one for me. Um, I did a big backpacking trip over the summer and the fact that I was able to edit photos on my smartphone because I just wanted to post photos while I was there. I don't want to wait like three weeks until I got home. Um, the fact that I edited them on a smartphone and when I came home, those edits were on my desktop version because it's all cloud-based. Was a, That was right. a big one for me. So yeah, it was very, very useful. Yeah, super cool. 
Um, I will show you one more new feature that we just shipped. This is just a little one, but I wasn't sure how I was doing on time. So I wanted to be sure I got to that before we signed off. We um, about 15 but was... minutes, I'll say. Okay, plenty so of time. time. So one of the things that is really cool um, about having stuff in the cloud is how easy it makes sharing and collaboration. So um, I don't know, let's see here, if I do, I'm not sure what I should, uh, have I done any of these? Is yeah, let me just photo? go. Uh, I'm just gonna go back here. So if I do, I, I turned this on a moment ago um, when I was, let me go into sharing and collaboration. So when I was talking about um, sharing HDR photos in Lightroom Web, any album that I've created in Lightroom, um, it doesn't have to be an album either. I can do it with a single photo, but here I'm demoing with an album. Um, I can go in and and turn on sharing. So I turned it on here. It's set to anyone can view, right? So anybody who goes to this link can see these photos. Now, if you did it right now, you would see these photos. Um, but there are permissions controls that you can use as well. So if I want, I can set it to invite only, and then I can invite people. And I can put in, you know, your email address if I want to invite you, Paco. And I can, you know, click on the invite button and it'll shoot you an email and invite you. You accept the invite and you now can see the photos and nobody else can. Um, and I, if I'm inviting someone, then I can choose to give that person elevated levels of permissions if I wish. So the default is just that they can view the photos in the album. Um, if they sign in, they can also um, comment and like on the photos, um, but they can't do anything to the album or photos themselves. Um, if I wish, I can give them contribute permissions, which means that they can also add photos into the album. They don't need to be a Lightroom customer to do that. They can go to uh, lightroom.adobe.com and a web browser and drag and drop photos in there and they'll show up in your album here in Lightroom. Um, really cool if you have like some kind of joint event you're working on, um, either professionally or even just something for fun, a wedding or something where everybody's snapping pictures, you want to like share them all together, you can do that. And then if you're working with, you know, like an editor, like this is fairly common, I know in wedding photography, for example, a wedding photographer might have an editor that they work with. And if they're working in Lightroom Classic, what they have to do is... I mean, there'd be a variety of ways to do it, but you probably what you would do is you'd like export a catalog and you would include either the originals or maybe more likely you'd include smart previews and then you would like upload that somewhere, maybe to Dropbox or you'd mail them a hard drive or, you know, whatever it might be. And then when they were done with it, you'd get, you wouldn't need the photos back from them, but you'd need the catalog back from them and then you'd import that catalog. You know, it's a mess, right? Um, if you're doing that in Lightroom, you just create the album here, you put your editor's address in here, you give them edit permissions and invite them. And now they can actually edit those photos and the edits that they do show up for you here uh, in Lightroom as well. Um, none of this is new, by the way. This is all already existing in Lightroom for quite some time. Um, I'll say one more thing about that workflow. I'm, I'm not really showing it to you because it requires like multiple accounts and that gets a little awkward in a one machine demo here and, and uh, we don't have a ton of time. Um, but I just want you to kind of know that it's there. Um, if you do share with someone with edit permissions, or maybe you share with multiple people and you give them all edit permissions, all of their edits are saved as versions. We saw that version panel earlier. So you can always go back to your original edit. You can switch between any of other people's edits. Um, so none, none of those, none of that gets like, none of your edits get like blown away by anything that any other editor in the album does. Okay, so that's all existing. But here's here's one use case for this. You put a bunch of photos into an album and you use it, you deliver it to a client. You share that album with a client and you say, hey, pick the ones you like. And they can click a little heart on the ones that they like in the album. And that all syncs back to you here in Lightroom. And then you just have to like look through the album looking for the little heart icon right? That's what you've had to do up until a few weeks ago. So you share 500 photos with a client, you say pick five. Now you're, you're like scrolling through, like looking for the ones that they picked. Not anymore. It's a tiny little feature, but it makes a big difference if you need it. You can go up here to the filters um, that let you search in things. And now you can search for photos based on whether or not they have likes or comments in a shared album. So really, really handy. You can click that, you know, and then you'll see just the ones that your client liked makes it so much easier. So that's new as of Max a few weeks ago as well. Um, 
that's all the new stuff, the newest, newest, new as of Mac stuff that I had to share and talk about. Um, I certainly have other things that I can use to fill our remaining minutes. Paco, you just let me know. Yeah, we have about 10 more minutes. Um, so I would say, yeah, let's let's just kind of look at some stuff that you might have in your back pocket. Um, I do see a YouTube comment. Um, Dan is asking, I'm a commercial photography and have a specific question that they don't want to interfere with the viewers. Um, let me know if I can ask it. Dan, we actually have some time right now um, to ask some questions. So if you feel comfortable, feel free to put it in the chat. It is public. Um, if you want it to be more private, um, let us know. And then maybe we can find a way that we can ask Ben um, offline. And then yeah, you, know, you can, can you can email me. You want to put my email address in the chat, Paco Ward W A R D E mm -hmm. at Adobe.com. At Adobe.com. So if you don't want to ask it, ask it now. If you if you're cool with it, if you don't want to, you can email me. Yeah, Dan, let us know if you want to ask it. We can knock it out right now since we uh, got through most of the features that we want to do. If it's more private, just let us know. I'll, I'll type in uh, Ben's email. And, uh, but yeah, about ten more minutes. Okay, so well, if you got any cool features or any any cool pro tips that we can show in this last segment, then. Uh, it's not gonna I'll out. show you. Yeah, I'll show you a couple things real quick. Um, just so you know, in case you don't, editing video in Lightroom. So Lightroom's not a video editor in the sense of stringing together multiple clips in a timeline. That's what like Premiere is for. But in terms of visual editing, editing the appearance of your video, you can totally do that in Lightroom. Um, this isn't new at Mac. We've had this for a little bit, but it's really cool. So I just want to be sure you know it's there. Um, you can do that in Lightroom, and you can do that. You know, using all of the same kind of edit all the same edit controls that you're already used to using on your photos. Um, not 100% of them. You'll notice that there are a few that are grayed out that don't work with video, but uh, the bulk of the editing controls do work on video as well. So really cool to be able to do that. You can copy and paste edit settings between photos and videos. So for example, you know, if you want to achieve a really consistent aesthetic across both a set of stills and video, you can do that. Just copy and paste edit settings back and forth between them. Um, of course, for anybody who doesn't know uh, how to do that in Lightroom, it's just Command C on the Mac. That would be Control C on Windows to copy the edit settings, copy edit settings. And then uh, you would do, you know, select any number of photos you wanted to paste to, Command V to paste. Um, so really neat. You can also trim if you've got some junk on the heads or the tails. Um, you can kind of bring in, you know, bring in the handles to trim off the end uh, or the beginning, however you want. Like all of the editing in Lightroom, of course, that's non-destructive. So you can go always go back in there later and bring in a little bit more of it. Um, so really neat. Um, much more capable uh, video editing in Lightroom than in Lightroom Classic. Uh, Lightroom Classic does let you edit video um, in a limited way using the quick develop panel, um, but not using the develop module. Um, so much more robust here in Lightroom. Really cool to be able to do that. Again, like I said, you're not like editing a feature film in here, right? But if you have a single video clip that you wanna like make look nice and send out to social media, we don't want you to have to leave Lightroom to do that. So you can do that in Lightroom now. Um, same same stuff also works uh, over on the phone. So you got all the same, you know, all those same controls over here on the phone as well. So it's pretty cool. Um, okay, that's one quick one. I can move on to another quick one. Yeah, let's do another one. Or, or chat, okay. maybe in these last like seven minutes that we have, is there any feature that you want um, more information on or you want to see something highlighted? highlighted? Uh, let us know. We got some time. Um, I do want to actually maybe throw in a suggestion. Um, I think, it's, is that Zion? A photo they took Zion next to the birthday cake? I'd love to see what you did with that photo. I was going to say that. Yeah. Either, Yosemite or Zion? Yeah, that's a great photo. It is, it is Zion. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is actually, actually, I'll, well, let me, I haven't done anything to the photo. This is out of camera. Um, but, but let me show you something about this. This, this is kind of cool. Um, there's a really neat feature in Lightroom. Lightroom Classic does not have this feature because it's cloud dependent. Um, but in Lightroom, we have this feature called recommended presets. So of course you're familiar if you use Lightroom Classic with edit presets. Um, and we've got all the same premium ones and all the same kind of pre-installed ones um, that Classic has. But then we also have this tab called recommended. And if I switch over to there, what Lightroom is doing is it's using AI to look at my specific photo. And then it's looking through a repository of hundreds of thousands of presets that are available in the cloud. And it's picking a handful that it thinks might work particularly well with my specific photo. So if I switch to a different photo, it would give me a different list of suggested presets here. It's a really neat way to start if you're like, eh, I 
don't even know what I want to do with this photo. It's a, like a great way to go and get inspiration. Um, I'm not clicking on anything here. I'm just rolling over the preset thumbnails. It's previewing uh, what it looks like on my image. I kind of like this one, but like, how about this? If I see one that I like, but it's not like 100%, like I'm not like, that's not exactly what I want. Um, I can click on more like this, and then it will filter that list of preset suggestions down to show me ones that are aesthetically similar to that one that I clicked on. Here's another, okay, that I like a little bit better. So I could just click to apply it. Once I've applied it, I get this amount slider down here so I can ramp up or down the intensity of the preset to my liking. And of course, as I'm sure you probably know, if you've used Lightroom, presets are just saved collections of edit settings, right? right. So you can see how it's moved all of the edit sliders. I can always go and do any kind of individual little tweak that I might want to do. Um, or as I move the amount slider, you can see how it's like shifting all the edit sliders around in response to that. So really neat feature, um, also available uh, on the phone. Um, so if I'm, you know, if I, whoop, that's not really where I wanted to be. What's happening on my phone? <laughs> I go into presets. I've got um, recommended uh, on the phone as well. So really neat, uh, really neat feature um, there in Lightroom. Uh, I have to, I have to plus one this feature. I, I actually used it a lot um, on that on that travel trip. You know, that was my first foray into really using Lightroom, and that was one of my favorite features. I actually have some presets that I still use to this day when I was kind of shopping around and exploring um, just from the recommended ones, just based on the photography I was taking. So that's right. That yeah. If, if you cool. see one that, yeah, if you see one that you really like and you want to be able to use it again, you can click right up here. You can say mm -hmm. save to your presets. And now, yeah. you know, it, I, it just names it by default, but I can, you know, call it whatever I want and click save. And now I find that over here in yours saved from community. There's that one that I just saved. So there it is. really, really neat. When we first introduced this feature, I showed it. I, I was out taking pictures with a friend of mine. He's a pretty serious photographer. And we're, you know, we're we're driving back home. I'm driving. He's in the passenger seat noodling on his phone, looking at pictures that we took. And I'm like, oh, have you checked out this feature? And he's like, no. And I'm like, oh, try it out. And he does. And he's like, oh, I'll, I'll try it on one of these pictures I just took. And he's kind of quiet for a second. And then he's like, wow, this, yeah, this one actually works really well with this photo. You, <laughs> you took all the fun out of it. I'm like, sorry, man. <laughs> you know, but yeah, it's neat. It's a cool feature. It is a cool feature. I agree. Um, um, all right. So we got about three more minutes. So maybe enough time for one more feature you want to showcase. Woo. Okay. I'm going to try to go fast. This is really, really neat. Okay. Okay. I'm going to open this up and oh, that's because I messed around with it over on my phone. Let me try a different one here. Do, do, do. Okay. So I'm going to go into masking here and you know, we have all this AI masking. We have all different kinds of AI masking. It can find people, it can find sky, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then uh, when you step into a person, of course, you can select different attributes of the person. Um, one thing that you might want to do uh, with something like this is like skin smoothing, right? Like you're a portrait photographer. You want to get skin looking really nice. So you maybe create a mask for the facial skin. You'd say create. And then you would do some really subtle edits. You'd probably take down texture a little bit. Maybe you'd shift hue a little bit. Maybe you'd adjust the shadows a little bit. What we're going to do is we're just going to do something super noticeable. Okay, I just really want you to be able to see it. We're going to pretend together that this is really beautiful, tastefully done skin smoothing that I did. And then I have like 50 other photos from the same session that I want it on, right? Well, you were never able to paste masks before, right? Because right. the person's not in the same spot in each one, or maybe it's even a different person, you know? So it's like you paste a mask onto another photo, sure, but it's not going to be in the right place. It doesn't work for you. But now that we have these AI masks, it just finds the right spot in each photo, right? So if I say, okay, I wanna copy settings from this photo, I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna choose edit settings to copy. I want only the masking, copy, great. And then I have these other photos. I've got like this one and this one, and whoop, sorry, I pushed the wrong button, this one. So here we go. I've selected these three other photos that have people in them, command V to paste. Hey, you're pasting masks. Yes, that's what I want, do it. It says, okay. I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. Is it going to do it? There we go. Yeah, and now it's pasted my in. skin smoothing onto all of my other photos. It's an incredible way to speed up batch workflows in Lightroom using AI masks. So really, really cool. How did I do on time there, Paco? 
you did we're right on time and I, and I think that's a great way you know it's that's tastefully done when we're pretending to be smoothie <laughs> it's also a great way just to turn all your talent into almost smurfs you know the blue right, smurfs right that's, yeah it's the smurf that. feature that's, basically yeah the smurf feature that came out great uh cool all right well that pretty much takes us at time um i want to thank you all for joining us don't go anywhere because uh the weekday edit with arabella and Ellie is coming up next. They are longtime Adobe live streamers. You know, awesome stuff in the photography and design world. So stick around for that. Uh, ben, thank you so much for joining us. You're a wealth of knowledge, my friend. You blew my mind with all these new features. And it's almost like you work for the Lightroom team. I, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, of you know course. So thank you, Parker. I love, I love doing this. Happy to come back anytime. Thank you. Thank you also to everybody who tuned in. Yes, likewise. Um, cool. Everybody, don't go anywhere. Stick around, and we will see you all shortly. Have a good one. Bye.